Hello, my name is David Berger, and it's a great pleasure to give today the Professor Joop Langer Memorial Lecture, which will be about new drugs for HIV prevention through key population. This presentation is part of the 23rd Bangkok International Symposium on HIV Medicine, held from January 14 to 15, 2021, as a virtual conference. These are my disclosures. I feel deeply honored to hold this lecture as a tribute to a great man, Professor Joop Lange. What I learned from Joop is that you can be both a scientist and an activist. You can do clinical research and also be active in society. These are not two different worlds. Also, it's important to be creative. Many people remember the famous phrase by Joop about that he, when people were discussing that it's not possible to deliver HIV treatment in Africa, that he was saying, well, when I go to Africa, I can get a cold uh, bottle of Coca-Cola on every corner of a street. So why is it not possible to deliver also HIV treatment to every corner of a street? And he was right. You should not think about what is impossible, but think about what is possible. And finally, many people who remember you know that he was very critical about other people and also about himself. There's that's not a problem. When you are friends, you can tell each other the truth. So my presentation will be about new drugs for HIV prevention, in other words, pre-exposure prophylaxis. That's not a new topic. It already started almost 10 years ago when Truvada was the first combination of drugs to be approved by the FDA for prevention of HIV infection, both as a, a once daily tablet, chronic administration, or uh, one, two years later, as an event-driven pre-exposure prophylaxis, where medication is only given just before uh, a sexual intercourse. In the years after the development and introduction of Truvada, various new developments have started, both on long-acting agents on uh, neutralizing antibodies, on vaginal microbicides, et cetera, et cetera. And now if we come to 2021, you can see there's a very large portfolio of new drugs in development for HIV prevention. In other words, this is also called pre-exposure 2.0. So what I will do today is to discuss a little bit about the drugs that we have currently for HIV prevention, which will be TDF and TAF. I will discuss various agents that are in clinical studies now for HIV prevention and that uh, if all these uh, studies will have positive results, hopefully will become available within the next five years. And then finally, I will spend a little bit of time on a more distant future, which probably will be implants and neutralizing antibodies. I hope you will accept that it's not possible for me at this moment to review all currently available data. So what I did is that I was bring a focus on what I believe are the most likely to become the relevant HIV prevention drugs in the near future. If you want to learn more about some newer ARTs and also newer formulations, I would like to invite you to also look for the presentation by Dr. Charles Flexner, who will give a presentation in a pharmacology session at the same conference on Friday, January 15 at 10.30 in the morning. So TDF or tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, of course, it's not a new drug for HIV prevention. We already have it for a couple of years, but I think there's still much to learn to improve the effectiveness of TDF. So we all know that adherence is crucial, but how can you measure adherence and also make intervention based on adherence? What we also don't know whether there is really good efficacy for TDF in all different subpopulation. And then finally, if patients or clients are going to use TDF for a long time as, as PrEP, uh, that may result in some toxicity, renal toxicity, bone toxicity. And we all know that the tenofovir alafimid fumarate or TAF is a safer uh, product of tenofovir. And this is also better in pre-exposure prophylaxis. So when we know that adherence is so important for the efficacy of a TDF in PrEP, uh, it's not surprising that people started to look at adherence measurements that you can use to improve the adherence in clients. 
Uh, initially, these were assays that were done at the laboratory, quite sophisticated and not very easy to implement in clinical practice. But quite recently, uh, the group by Monica Gandhi and also others have worked on point of care tests that you can directly use when the client is coming to your clinic. And this is a non-invasive test. You can use urine for this and you can uh, get the measurements directly on the spot and you can give an intervention to the client if it turns out that he is not adherent to the, um, the, to the TDF. Here you can see the, uh, the strips that are being used and the mechanism behind the assay is that it's working on the antibody against tenofovir. So if the um, subject is using uh, tenofovir, then the um, antibody will uh, keep away the, the, the tenofovir in the urine. Which means that if you don't see a signal, which you can see here on the right strip, if you don't see a signal, actually it means that the client is using tenofovir, so that is positive. If he's not using tenofovir, then you will only see the antibody, and so this is on the left side of the, of the strip. This test, uh, this point of care test, has been validated against the, ten, the gold standard for the LCMS uh, assay. And actually, what is important, what you can see, is that it, especially the number of true negatives, so when a subject is non adherent, there's no enough of it in the urine, this test has a very high percentage of, of a score. So all the almost all the negative samples are adequately scored by the point of care test. So this is a very important uh, intervention, uh, which is not that expensive and should be uh, quite easy to implement at your clinic. The other aspect that is important about the current use of TDF in PrEP is that we've learned over the last couple of years much more about this agent in various subpopulations. This is a study that was uh, published last year on uh, tenofovir and antihistamine levels in transgender women. Um, and it turned out that when these uh, transgender women were using estrogens, um, that actually the levels of both tenofovir and emtocytabine were a bit lower than uh, in the cisgender men, where originally the TDF was studied and, and tested. It's not completely clear whether there's lower exposure to, the, to both those agents eventually will lead to a less protective effect of, of this combination. It's important to study also the pharmacokinetics of these agents in the various subpopulations because we cannot assume that they will all be the same. Another example of uh, some subjects uh, that we've been recently uh, consulted about uh, are clients who may have some kind of gastrointestinal uh, disorder. So we were uh, involved in a case of a patient or a client, I should say, who had had a total gastrectomy and wanted to use the novofear amcitabine as PrEP. When we looked at the plasma concentrations of both agents, they were considerably lower than what we found normally. So we doubled the dose in this PrEP situation, and then we had normal levels. And more or less the same experience was presented by our colleagues from Torino, Italy, where they also found lower tenofovir plasma levels in a couple of patients with various gastrointestinal disorders. So again, it's important to realize that these are specific subpopulations where not necessarily you can guarantee the effectiveness of, of PrEP by using TDF FTC. And you can do this kind of pharmacokinetic studies to learn more about it and give a more um, optimized advice how to use the PrEP. So we all know the TAF as an improved version of TDF in the treatment of HIV infected patients. Uh, and this is based on the fact that despite a lower dose that you give as, as TAF, uh, you get much higher intercellular concentration of the tenofovir diphosphate and much lower plasma concentration of tenofovir, uh, leading to a lower uh, toxicity risk when you use TAF versus TDF. So the question is, is that also for benefit in the pre-exposure prophylaxis setting? But this has been uh, studied in the so-called DISCOVER study that was presented last year at the Mexico conference and, uh, and published in July of 2020 in the Lancet HIV. So this was a randomized double-blind non-inferiority trial where uh, TDF was compared to uh, uh, FTAF um, in quite a, a large number of, of clients who were at risk uh, for getting HIV. 
Here you can see the primary efficacy endpoint data uh, and the HIV incidence in the, uh, the standard uh, of care arm of, of TDF FTC was 0.34, and this was uh, lowered to 0.16 in the TAF FTC arm. And you can see on the right part of the slide that uh, indeed the TAF FTC met the non inferiority criteria. Um, so it was comparable to the F, uh, FTC uh, TDF in this study. Um, what is important to, to also look at the, uh, the concentrations of the tenofovir uh, diphosphate in both study arms, because you can see some differences uh, between these two uh, products of, of, TDF, of, of tenofovir. So here you can see the, the diphosphate levels in the FTAF users and the FTDF users. We know from earlier studies with uh, TDF FTC that you really uh, need to be adherent for at least four doses per week, because if you are below that figure, there is uh, less efficacy of the uh, FTC TDF, which you can see also confirmed in this study, because the 15 cases where data were available uh, almost all of them had lower than four doses per week uh, taken um, the uh, TDF FTC uh, based on the um, tenofovir uh, diphosphate levels. But the difference between those who had adequate levels versus those who did not have adequate levels is very small, as you can see. That is much more different if you look at the left panel of, of this uh, picture where there's a very strong difference between those patients who had uh, a, a, um, acquired HIV in the FTAF uh, combination arm versus the, page, the clients that did not uh, acquire HIV. Uh, and from this data, you can uh, understand that the uh, FTAF combination is much more forgiving um, so that um, it's less of a problem if uh, subjects are less adherent, you still have adequate uh, plasma levels and intercellular levels of uh, the tenofovir diphosphate. So if we know that adherence is so important for the efficacy of uh, PrEP, um, people have started to look at other ways of administrating the HIV drugs. In this case, it's about carbotegravir, which is a drug quite similar to dolutegravir, so an integrase inhibitor. And that has been developed both for treatment and for prevention of HIV. Um, in the treatment, it's combined with ribavirin, but in prevention studies, you can give it alone and you can give it as a long acting injectable agent. It was studied in the HPTN 077 study, where they looked at two different uh, dosing schedules. The first uh, was an 800 milligram infusion uh, over uh, once every 12 week with intramuscular injection, I should say. And that was compared to a 600 milligram injection given every eight weeks. Here you can see the pharmacokinetic data on the carbotegravir plasma levels given every 12 weeks versus every eight weeks. What you can see here is that uh, there are a couple of subjects in the uh, 12 week schedule with relatively low concentrations, about one to four times the protein adjusted IC, IC90. And that has been shown earlier uh, is in the risk of uh, losing your efficacy against HIV. Especially when people start with the, uh, with the injection, there are quite some subjects initially with lower exposure. Um, the other thing that also was found in, in this study is that uh, uh, consistently, um, male subjects had lower concentrations than female subjects, and that also been, has been confirmed in, in other studies. So it's important to, to look at gender, uh, and but also to look at other factors that might explain lower exposure to carbotegravir. The other is important aspect was that um, subjects with a higher BMI, so above the median value, also had lower carbotegravir concentrations. Well, the combination of all these data uh, um, indicated that maybe the 12 week schedule could be uh, adequate for some uh, subjects, especially women with a lower uh, BMI, but definitely not for all subjects. So then the eight week schedule was further developed because that consistently provided adequate exposure to carbotegravir, both for men and women, and also for subjects with a higher BMI. So this eight week schedule uh, was studied in a phase three study that was uh, presented last summer at the Virtual Age 2020 conference. 
uh, and that was in the HPT and O83 study. This was a study that compared so the eight-week injection of carbotecrevir with the standard of care, the oral administration of TDF FTC. And this was a double-blind placebo control, which means that the subjects in the carbotecrevir arm also received the placebo pill of uh, TDF FTC, but also the subjects in the TDF FTC arm also received placebo injections um, during the whole study. What was a very important result from this study is that the carbotecrevir eight-week injections uh, had far less uh, infections during follow-up than the TDF FTC uh, arm of the study. You can see the difference here is about threefold. And although this study was designed as a non-inferiority study, actually the difference was that large that actually we can say that the carbotecrevir injection was superior to the TDF FTC. And this is a very important uh, result from the study, especially if you realize that you give one drug uh, and it is better than giving two drugs, probably because uh, the route of administration favors the adherence uh, in the clients at the risk for HIV acquisition. There were 13 HIV infections in the carbotecrevir arm and the investigators made a very detailed analysis to learn from these infections and they uh, were able to divide these 13 incidents in four different groups, which you can see here in A, B, C, and D. So the two A subjects actually already acquired HIV uh, prior to the administration of the study product. So that is not really a failure of the carbotecrevir. There were also five subjects in the in category B who acquired HIV after they had discontinued carbotecrevir for a long time. So actually that's also not really uh, a failure by carbotecrevir. The subjects simply did not adhere to the injections. Then there were a couple of infections, three uh, that uh, happened in the very early oral lead-in phase. So not really the injection, not a long acting injection, but the four weeks of the oral lead-in phase. And then finally you can find five uh, subjects who really got the infection despite continuous uh, and also on-time carbotecrevir injections. So I think it's very important to analyze these uh, incident HIV infections in this way because we can really learn from the way how the drug is being used, how it is being administered and that the actually results is even better if you uh, only look at the five true carbotecrevir failures versus uh, the 13 in total. Of course, this drug also has some side effects and especially a lot of attention has been paid to the injection site reaction. Um, this is something that we really have to deal with. Uh, it's happening in almost 80% of the subjects. Usually it, it becomes less severe over time and, and also the uh, uh, um, toxicity and the complaints about the the side reactions only last for, for one or two days. So they are relatively mild and, and not persistent. But they come back every time you, you get a new uh, injection, especially in, in a subgroup of, of subjects who continue to have uh, this kind of toxicity. And we have to see once this uh, drug will be used as PrEP in, in clinical practice, what will be the, uh, the experience uh, with these injection side reactions and how we can minimize them. Of course, there's another important aspect on toxicity of integrase inhibitors that uh, raised a lot of uh, concern over the last couple of years, and that was the body weight increases. So that has also been looked at in this uh, prevention trial. And uh, there's a clear difference with the data from, from the integrase inhibitors in HIV-infected patients on treatment, um, that in this case, in the prevention trials, the, there's a minimal uh, increase in, in body weight and, and even not significantly different from the, from the TDF FTC. And that was the same uh, um, experience in the uh, phase two trial of top carbotecrevir with only a minimal increase over, over 41 weeks. Finally, there's one other concern in addition to the, to the toxicity, and that is what ha will happen uh, once subjects uh, stop uh, uh, injecting the carbotecrevir for whatever reason. Um, 
if they are at risk for acquiring HIV infection during that period, when there are quite low levels of carbotegravir, there is a possibility that that will develop uh, integrase uh, resistance. And that period can be quite long as has been studied here um, in the phase two trial that uh, as you can see on the X axis up to some subjects even up to, to 200 weeks after the last injection. So that is really multiple years uh, they can still have detectable uh, carbotegravir concentrations. So they can be at risk for acquiring resistance when they get HIV at that period. Then the last aspect on carbotegravir is that there is also another study, the HPTN084, and quite recently we saw a press release uh, that is also effective in a different patient population, in this case of cisgender women in Sub-Saharan Africa. The HIV incidence uh, in the women on carbotegravir was only 0.21% if you compare it to uh, TDF FTC 1.79%. So that's a ninefold difference. And um, when the DSMB saw these blinded uh, data, they uh, decided uh, to recommend uh, to terminate the study. And that was followed by the sponsor of, of the study. More details will be uh, presented at conferences and uh, in the scientific uh, journals. So then we move to another route of administration of uh, drugs for HIV prevention, and this is vaginal microbicides. A lot of uh, studies have been uh, done over the last 10, 15 years, but I must say with quite some disappointing results. So this is from a recent review where in fact, there's only one intervention that gave a significant reduction, and that's the dapiferin ring. Dapiferin is a non-mucoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. And in two separate studies, this has shown to be protective against HIV, although the efficacy was uh, only about 29% um, on average, which is not a very strong effect if you compare it to the other interventions that we've discussed so far. However, there was a recent publication when people looked at uh, an indication of the adherence of the women when they apply the uh, vaginal ring um, that uh, when these rings were collected at each study visit uh, and analyzed for the remaining content of the piverine in these rings, you see a very large uh, difference um, which suggests that uh, some women uh, will have taken out the ring uh, during the months that they were uh, expecting to use it. Uh, and in that period, uh, the, the piferin was not uh, released. Um, so if they looked at the, the rings with um, the, let's say the lowest remaining content of the piferin, so the highest uh, concentration of the piferin release uh, in, in these women, then actually the protective effect was larger than the average 27% that I just showed you. And that uh, efficacy can even be increased to 75 to 91 percent if really the full amount of the piferine is being released over the whole period of, of that month. So actually this is another indication how important adherence is. Um, if these women consistently uh, use this vaginal ring, they will be much more protected than when they use it only incidentally. The next topic will be about uh, a new drug from uh, the nucleoside uh, class, uh, Islatovir, formerly known as NK8591. And this is a very interesting uh, drug uh, in development for both treatment and prevention, but I will now focus on the prevention studies. Uh, it has a dual mechanism of action, which is quite new. Uh, so it has both translocation inhibition and it has a delayed chain termination. And this combined mechanism of action uh, results in a very high potency of the islatovir, both against wild type HIV and also to drug resistant variants. And it's also has a very high barrier to resistance. So this is very interesting drug for, for prevention. Um, and it is being uh, studied at this moment, either as an oral administration, when the subjects only have to take one tablet per month, or uh, developed as an implant, which might be used for, for the whole period of one year. And here you can see the studies that are ongoing at the moment, a uh, phase two safety study and two different phase three studies um, of the oral tablets. 
Um, but what I think is more interesting to look at a little bit more distant future is about the use of this agent in, in implants. And this was uh, a first of uh, a human trial that was uh, presented uh, last year. Um, and I will show you some of the pharmacokinetic data. Um, so this is an implant, uh, which is quite similar to uh, implanon or nexplanon. Uh, so it's using the same polymer, uh, but now with the latovir at a very low dose in that, in that implant. And uh, initially there was some simulation of the PK profiles, which suggested that um, you could um, use it for, for maybe six months or even a year. So they designed uh, a study um, and, and when they uh, administered the total dose of 62 milligrams in that implant, it was uh, projected that uh, the concentrations that will be released from that implant will be sufficient to prevent against HIV infection for, for more than one year. And they were able to find a target uh, which the concentration needs to be above to ensure this protective effect. So um, this is now uh, being studied uh, in more detail and hopefully we will get data on these implants in, in the next couple of years. Then finally, the last uh, drug or uh, group of drugs I want to, to mention this is, is the broadly neutralizing uh, antibodies, which uh, has been studied already for quite some years. Um, and the most promising agent uh, is the VRC01 antibody directed at the CD4 binding sites um, which is now um, starting in phase two studies. Um, there has been some problems with the way of administration that it needs to be uh, infused intravenously given every 14 days or every month, which is not very convenient if you com combine it, compare it to the intermuscular injections of carbotecophere, which now can be given every eight weeks or maybe the implant, which can be used once in a year. But still, I think it's an interesting approach and we will have to see the data in the next couple of years. So my conclusions on the new drugs for HIV prevention is that we clearly have now reached the PrEP 2.0 era. So we have to do better than just giving TDF FTC, as I explained to you. Uh, the effectiveness of this uh, combination can be improved by using multiple interventions. And TUF is the improved version of TDF. It will be more forgiving uh, it will be less toxic and maybe the price at the moment is still uh, the problem that people continue to use TDF. But once the price of tough FTC will be as low as we now have it for TDF FTC, then definitely more people will start using tough FTC for PrEP. I think a very interesting new drug for prevention, carbotecophere, which hopefully will become available soon when it's given 600 milligram every eight weeks is even better than the oral administration. It will be interesting to see a comparison to the TAF FTC to see whether carbotecophy is even also superior to TAF FTC. And we really have to learn what will be the tolerability in clinical practice. It will be given to HIV negative clients, so you won't accept any toxicity or at least minimal toxicity. And how is that going to work in, in real life? But then after that, I think really the implants are a very interesting uh, approach and you really have the, the potential to become the true game changer. If you imagine that people will get an implant and they can use it for one year and will be protected against HIV. So I think that's something we hope to see uh, in a couple of next years. So then finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference and hopefully we can meet with each other in Bangkok next year. Thank you, goodbye.